In this next section, we are going to explore the role that soil plays in Earth's processes of biogeochemical cycling. Now that is a large and complex term, so what is biogeochemical cycling? Let's break it down. Bio, as you probably know, means that these processes pertain to living organisms, while geo means earth, ground, or land, and chemical refers to a specific atomic or molecular substance. So taken together, biogeochemical cycling refers to the complex flow of matter through both living organisms and the Earth's non-living systems, like the atmosphere and water. We probably already have a good handle on one of the major biogeochemical cycles from our discussions in Chapter 2, and that is the carbon cycle. Carbon is an extremely important element for living organisms. In fact, it's the basis for all of the essential organic molecules, like DNA, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And in our discussion of cellular respiration and photosynthesis, we looked at how carbon flows in and out of living things. Carbon is found in the non-living system of the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide gas, and photoautotrophs absorb that carbon dioxide and transform it into the biological molecules that we've heard about, like carbohydrates. This is referred to as carbon fixation capturing the gaseous carbon from the atmosphere and fixing it into other biological molecules. Then those biological molecules are broken down through the process of cellular respiration if oxygen is available, or other metabolic processes if oxygen is not available, which releases the carbon dioxide back out into the atmosphere as a waste product and the cycle comes full circle. So how does the carbon cycle relate to soil? Well, the soil provides the medium for plant growth, and plants are a major player in the half of the cycle that involves carbon fixation, along with their aquatic photoautotroph cousins, algae and cyanobacteria. So soil provides the foundation for plants to absorb carbon, but soil also provides the habitat for the major decomposers, bacteria, fungi, and certain types of worms and insects. The decomposition of organic matter is the opposite of photosynthesis. Through cellular respiration or other metabolic processes like fermentation, decomposers will break down organic molecules and release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And the significance of the role that these decomposers play in this half of the carbon cycle really cannot be understated. In most countries, over 90% of the total carbon dioxide that is released from heterotrophs comes from decomposers in the soil. Less than 10% comes from the carbon dioxide that is exhaled by humans and other animals. And over 90% of the carbon flowing back out into the atmosphere comes from decomposers in the soil. So soil makes a huge contribution to the carbon cycle in this way. These figures here show the percentages of heterotrophic carbon dioxide release contributed by humans in the top map and livestock animals on the bottom map by country. So as you can see, in a vast majority of countries, humans exhale less than 1% of the carbon dioxide, and livestock animals usually exhale less than 10% of the carbon dioxide in most countries. And note that in these images, um, they don't take into consideration the release of carbon dioxide by plants when they break down carbohydrates that they've synthesized for their own purposes. And they also don't take into consideration the release of carbon dioxide from unnatural sources like the burning of fossil fuels. They just look at the release of carbon dioxide by heterotrophs when they burn energy to fuel their cells and bodies. But even so, hopefully these figures give you a picture of the extremely significant role that soil decomposers play in the carbon cycle. But soil is not only crucially involved in cycling carbon, but also pulling carbon out of the cycle entirely. And that's because soil can also act as what's called a carbon sink, a reservoir that can absorb and store an element for an appreciable amount of time. Because especially in very cold regions or wetland habitats where there's not a lot of oxygen available because the soil is so waterlogged, not all of the living things that die fully decompose. The organic matter in dead plants and animals gets deposited in the ground, but it doesn't decay. 
meaning that it doesn't cycle back into the atmosphere and instead gets stored in that form for a very long period of time. A very prominent example of how these cold and wet carbon sinks serve to sequester organic matter out of the carbon cycle that you may have seen in the media are bog bodies and ice mummies. So bog bodies is a term used to describe human re remains that were put to rest in a peat bog, which is an extremely waterlogged swampy terrain. And because of the lack of oxygen, the decomposers in that habitat can't perform cellular respiration and break down the organic material in the body. So it barely decomposes. So on the left is the Toland man. Um, this is a bog body that was found near Toland, Denmark, and it dates to well over 2000 years ago. And on the right is La Doncella, a girl whose remains were recovered from the Andes, which is a very tall, cold mountain range in South America. So freezing operates the same way to sequester carbon and pull it out of the cycle by preventing biological molecules from decomposing. There is one other cycle of metabolic processes that we need to talk about while we're on the subject of soil and carbon, and that is methanogenesis. Methanogenesis is a special metabolic process that transforms carbon dioxide, uh, CO2, and other organic molecules into a gaseous chemical called methane, CH4. And only certain microbes within a distinct group known as archaea that are called methanogens are able to do this. Um, these archaea are they're different from bacteria. They're distinct in the tree of life. Methanogenesis does not require oxygen. And so it is possible in oxygen depleted environments. And methanogens are prevalent in many soil types and they play an important role as decomposers. At the same time, there are other microbes that are able to use methane, the product of methanogenesis as a source of nutrition. And these methanotrophs, as they are called, will convert the methane back into CO2. And both methanogens and methanotrophs are common in anaerobic, um, oxygen-depleted environments like wetlands, marshes, uh, human landfills, etc. And a final note, um, methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. It's many times more powerful than carbon dioxide at retaining heat. And so when it comes to discussions of the atmosphere and climate later on in the course, methane will be coming back to us as a factor in these processes.